Hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so you know what that means. It's time for another midweek mini mail call. This is number 19, if you can believe it, 19. It's hard to believe that I've done so many of these. Anyway, there's lots of stuff to cover today, so let's get right to it. The next package here, it's relatively heavy. It's a USPS priority mail. Comes from Michael in Stafford, Virginia. Hi to all my viewers in Virginia. That's here in the United States on the East Coast. Uh, yeah, that's one thing that I don't love about this little cutting device is it rolls off the table really easily. It really could benefit from a little, I don't know, beveled edges or whatnot. So when you put it down, it didn't just roll off. Let's bypass the note and go right into the goodies. Ooh, I see all sorts of interesting things here. Very nicely wrapped. Everything is sort of individually taken care of. Okay, well, I'm going to have to say my favorite word, cornucopia of stuff on the table here. Right on the top, we have a micro cassette user guide. This looks to be something that plugs into the Commodore. New audio player interface for Commodore 64 and 128s. Oh, this is pretty neat. Okay, this looks to be a device that allows you to plug your cassette port into your PC or anything that has a headphone jack, really, for playing back tape files on your computer and loading them on your Commodore. Wow, okay, so there's a lot of cool things. Okay, so this little box says C64C keyboard mounts, and very nice. Uh, what this is, it's a 3D printed plastic piece here for mounting your keyboard in your Commodore 64C and includes a couple screws. All right, well, let's keep looking here. Okay, so here in this box is a LumaFix 64. It's just a regular LumaFix board. Now, I built one of these up myself. I did not have a good luck with that thing. <laughs> and the little instruction sheet that comes with this LumaFix says, enjoy image with less stripes. <laughs> I will try this LumaFix out, see if it works better than the one I made. Perhaps it will change my mind on the value of LumaFixes, but so far I'm completely unconvinced. All right, the next thing is pretty funny. Mike sent this to me, and what is this? It's an anti-static strap. So many people uh, want me to use proper ESD protection. I do actually have some of these straps. I don't use them because they're just a pain in the butt. I don't, you know, I'm moving around in the, in the lab all the time. And these things, you're, you're literally plugged into a ground. So, yeah, they don't really work so great for me. All right, uh, let's see, what's this? In this bag, looks like we have some little adapters or something. It says IntelliNet 100 Base T. Okay, in this little bag here, we have, oh, handy. Okay, this is just um, one of these multi-function kind of flashcard reader things. Comes with a USB cable. So this one is actually made by TIAC. Okay, okay, this looks like it's Digital Power Supply Tester by a company called Manhattan. Fascinating, and what's in here? It looks like a fuse, a couple of fuses, fast-acting fast Radio Shack fuses. Whoops, dropping them all over the place. Well, that's cool, we'll have to take a look at that in a sec. I don't have any kind of power supply tester. All right, looks like right here is nothing retro so much. 2.5 inch to three and a half inch, whoop, almost dropped that, adapter. Uh, we have a cable here, and yep, this looks like uh, the Commodore IEC cable. Okay, in this bag, what do we have here? Okay, so there's a sticker that says, oh, Jiffy DOS. So there's a ROM chip in here, there's a Commodore part number, I'll have to look up what this is. It is an EEPROM. I don't think that's a Jiffy DOS on there. Could be, but it won't, doesn't have a Jiffy DOS sticker on it. And also in that little package was, looks like some laptop memory. Just a few little small SO dims in there. And we have a little box and it says PC Utilities. These feel like floppy disks. Neat, we have an original copy of Windows for Workgroups 311 and a few other blank floppies or ones without labels at least. Okay, we have another one of these little anti-static boxes. Now it says SID on here. I don't think it's got a SID in here. Uh, looks like some more MOS chips and also one 1541 ROM chip of some kind. We'll take a look at that in a second. Just making sure I'm going through everything. What's this here? Yeah, okay, so it looks like a user port connection for Commodore, and on there is an ESP, 
Oh, I can't quite see. It's either an ESP32 or an ESP8266. Well, so with something like this, with the right software, you would be able to get internet on your Commodore, probably your PET and or 64 and our VIC-20. All of them could use this technically. All right, we have a CD or it looks like a DVD here for that micro cassette that was the manual for it. You know, I don't think I've seen the micro cassette yet, right? We haven't seen that. No, that's the Lumafix. Okay, I think it's right there. Let's just check out quickly what's in this box. Okay, so on the outside, and it is what it says, it's a USB to IDE SATA adapter. Okay, we have the last package, which is sort of full of interesting things. But here is the micro cassette. So this is pretty nice. The case is actually not 3D printed. It's, it's molded and uh, injection molded. This would plug into the cassette port on your Commodore. And on the back here, it has a three and a half millimeter uh, audio input. That would be from your computer. It'd be from your, say your laptop, your phone, whatever it is. And you would play back the tape. And I'm assuming that this DVD here is probably full of cassette games. And this is a really easy way to avoid the hassle of trying to get a data set working. Now you could use a data set with like a little audio cassette adapter. Remember those things for your car stereo? Technically that could work, but this is gonna be a lot more reliable and a lot easier to use. And in addition, he sent me uh, oh, a nice little assortment of fans. And these look new. This is a Foxconn a small fan. Uh, we have a little uh, SCSI Terminator. Awesome. And another fan, another Foxconn fan. Okay, and then um, also he sent me a bunch of cables. These uh, looks like three AV cables for 8-bit microcomputers. They have their different types. They have DIN connectors on them. And then we have an audio cable. So cool. Okay, let's take a look at this stuff on the bench. The box that Mike sent is certainly chocked full of lots of stuff. I really do have to laugh at this grounding strap here. So let me cut this open and take a look at it. As I had mentioned before, I do have some of these actually floating around the, the lab already. I just don't use them because they're just so inconvenient. I am not adverse to getting one of those pads for the desk here that would be grounded and good for soldering so I wouldn't burn into the desk so much. Although I've been pretty good to prevent that over time. I just haven't had the opportunity to end up with the right mat and I'm not quite sure which one to order and the size and how you cut it and how you take care of it and how you properly ground it and all that stuff. And I just haven't done the research. Look at the instructions. Yeah, various ways to ground yourself properly. Talks about using a, some kind of a pad that then needs to be grounded into your electrical mains outlet ground connection. And there's even testers to make sure that the entire system is working properly. Here's an up close look at that multi flashcard reader thingamajiggy that he sent. It is made by TIAC and the nice solid metal construction that definitely indicates that this is going to be more reliable than that piece of crap that I have in my machine now. There is one issue though, is this USB cable. It does have a standard connection to go on the motherboard. This is far too short. This probably was installed in a small desktop type computer where the motherboard was just right under the drive bays. But my trash lab computer underneath the zip drive here, I have electrical tape covering the broken card slot thing so I don't use it. But you can see that up here is a bit far away from the down corner of the back of the motherboard that will be way down there where the USB connections are. But next time I work on that computer, I will at least install this in there and attempt to see if this cable's long enough. And if not, maybe I can somehow dig through my spare parts to find a longer one. Two and a half to three and a half inch hard drive adapter. I don't know, not much to say here other than you could take a little SSD connected into there. And then on the back side of this, on the other side, there is the pass-through connectors for power and SATA. Plastic, so even though this looks like these are heatsink fins, there's no heatsink and it's gonna actually happen here. I will keep this handy next to this. So next time I work on that computer, I will move the two and a half inch SSD into this and out of the double-sided tape or piece of Velcro, or I, I honestly feel like it's just lying in the bottom of the case. Like I just threw it in there, plugged in, and, and called it good. So it's called Trash Lab for a reason, that thing. It's just total trash. Here is a Commodore IEC cable. That's the usual DIN there, six pin DIN. Interesting is it has sort of melted plastic all over this. So this was stored somewhere where things got very hot. And if you've ever seen an old 8-bit computer like a 64 and you had wires like this sitting on top of it in storage for a long time in the heat and cold or whatever, it ends up putting these circular marks on the plastic. It almost looks like someone dropped soldering iron onto it or something as there's some chemical reaction between the, the rubber and the plastics and like whatever, and it, it basically melts into the case. But it happens both ways. And whatever this was sitting on top of, 
sort of melted onto the cable. Here is a bunch of random stuff. Uh, this is some laptop RAM. I can see your PC100 at 128 megabytes. So pretty sure this is the same stuff that goes into the Panasonic Toughbook, but I have that thing maxed out. I tried putting a 256 in there and it did not work. It did not accept it. That was a donation from another viewer. So I'll put this in my parts bin. In this bag are some little adapters. What, what are these exactly? If people recognize these, please let me know. So this is, these are molded connections. There's nowhere for a cable to come out. So these are, look like some kind of loopback adapters. So serial, serial, and parallel. So perhaps loopbacks for PC diagnostics. And this there was in the bag and it seems like it's 100 base T splitter. I mean, that doesn't make sense. And in this bag here was this power supply tester. So these were additional fuses, there were two there. And this definitely looks like some type of an ATX power supply tester made by Manhattan. So the ATX power supply would connect here. This is one of the, the larger, newer style ones with all the pins. And then on this end, you have some inputs as well. So I suppose you can either plug in the Molex connectors, the Berg connectors, or the, what, video card, eight or four pin, and the six pin motherboard connectors into this thing. And it probably powers up and gives you a little status screen. Looks like for testing, you just plug in the ATX power supply and it will do some tests. Then you plug in one at a time each of the other types of connections. And it says you must remove the non-ATX connector after each test. Do not plug more than one additional power connector in at a time. I am wondering if this thing simply tests the voltage or is it actually testing like load? And there's probably not enough in here to test load because you would need heat sinks and stuff like that. So I'm assuming all this is doing is simply testing the voltage rails, which, you know, you can just do with a multimeter. There's some more stuff in a bag, Jiffy Doff sticker. What is this chip here? Here's an EEPROM 318.045-01. This is firmware for the 1581. That's Commodore's three and a half inch disk drive that used the IEC protocol. Pretty sure this is an EEPROM here. So I'm gonna soak this to get this label off and I will be able to reuse this EEPROM. I don't have a 1581 and if I did, I doubt I would need this ROM chip. So if anything, this will be more useful to me as a blank EEPROM that I can use somewhere else. And what you see here in red, which is very odd to me, 901227-02, this is a kernel ROM for the C64 and the dash two indicates this is the second revision. Dash three is super, super common. Dash two, a little bit less so, and then dash one is only used in the very first C64s, and you don't find those very often. If you've seen MOS chips like this with red writing, please let me know. It's not something I've ever seen. We have a little blue box filled with some more ICs. We'll just pop this open. Looks like some more Commodore stuff. Let's do a quick look up. Quick Google revealed what these chips are. This is the 1541-2 DOS chip. It has more pins than these other ones because it, it combined a couple chips into one. And this is 1541 DOS, as, as is this one. And this one says Magnum Load 1541. So that must be some kind of bootloader, turbo bootloader for the 1541. What's underneath here? Boy, just a blank chip. So it's almost like that was a one-time programmable ROM, perhaps, that someone flashed that code on. If anyone knows what Magnum Load is, please let me know. But these are just uh, stock ROM chips, which were probably taken out of a disk drive when Jiffy DOS was installed. We had that Jiffy DOS sticker a second ago. So these would be the residual chips from that. Here's that box of disks. Not much to report. Windows Work Group 311. And some blank disks. Down here sitting next to this PC, which is the PC that I actually use the most. I need to make a video about this thing, kind of show off what this machine's all about and what I have in here and stuff. But I always have a stack of disks here. These are sitting here ready to be formatted. So usually it's disks that people give me. So like these four that I just got from Mike, I'll put them on the top here. And then I just occasionally, while I'm working on something else, I'll run a format QM and just sit here and stick disks in. And that program has an audible alert. So if there's an error, you hear a good tone or you hear a bad tone if there's a problem with the disk. If it's a bad disk, it goes in the trash. If it's a good disk, it goes in a different box of good formatted disks. And that's the way I keep myself up on a good stock of floppies. Right now I have quite a lot of floppies in general of all types. So I'm in a really good spot when it comes to blanks. Next from Mike was this little box that included a couple very nice 3D printed keyboard brackets for the 64C computers. Looks like these originally came from iComp.de. So German shop selling accessories. Ooh, they seem to make some nice 
metal ones as well. In fact, Mike, now I'm curious if this is what you ordered from iComp and you sent me your 3D printed ones. I am not complaining, don't get me wrong. I actually think that these work absolutely good enough and fine, but these nice metal ones, they look pretty snazzy. I actually have a 64C here that I think needs keyboard brackets. Now the keyboard is in there, it's not flopping down. But if I push over on that side, the keyboard bends. So I don't think there's a support here. I think I just have one on this side. So I think it's time that I'll install these 3D printed ones in here. I have a 3D printer myself and I had intended just to print a couple, just hadn't gotten around to it. So the fact is I have these, let's install them. And yes, I have a brown bread bin keyboard in the 64C. I happen to like this color combo. And in, I also have the white keyboard from this in a VIC-20 case that has a 64 motherboard in it. So it's like an all white 64. It's kind of like the Aldi 64 that was sold in Germany. Now, if I lift up the keyboard, there's the short board. Now, it's interesting as I only have one 64C short board and this is it. Because I wanted to have at least one short board, I bought this one from Europe. It was missing the socketed ICs, which is really just the VIC-2 and the SID chip. This SID chip was one of the Chinese ones I bought. That's how I was able to test it because I happened to have this board. I converted it to NTSC by switching the crystal oscillator over. I switched the jumper wherever that is. And I have an NTSC VIC-2 chip in here, one that works on these uh, lower voltage boards. And this thing does work, it's my only one. I wanted to have this in a case because it's the only SID that's an 8580, which is slightly different sounding than 6581s and all the other ones I have. So I wanted to have this working. Now I turned out that the long boards in the 64Cs have different mounting brackets for the keyboard and I couldn't reuse them. Or maybe I could reuse this one. I think I reused this one from the original one. I had to cut, cut some parts off of here, but the one on this side was part of the RF shield and it just, it just didn't work. So look at the ones that Mike said, I'm pretty sure this goes like this and will go under the motherboard around this standoff. And then the keyboard lines up here and screws in right there. And that's the way this one works. And I realized that all of the screws holding the motherboard in are Torx. What happened there? I, I can't say that I've seen any other 64s come through the digital basement here that are Torx like this. This is the only one. So it is always surprising to me when I open it up and figure out that I can't easily take it out. So yeah, that just goes in like that. And we'll just put this Torx screw back in there. I'll change out this metal one while I'm at it. I don't remember what I had to modify on this, but I am positive I cut something off of here to allow this to fit over here. But maybe, maybe I'm not correct anymore. So that just sits right there. Just one screw to hold that in. And now the keyboard is ready to be reinstalled. On these cases, the keyboard just sort of slots in on the bottom here, no screws or anything. And on the top, this sits on the brackets and there's a screw there and a screw there, and that's all you need to do to hold the keyboard in place. I knew it was under the towel. There's a little bag here with two additional screws that hopefully fit into those 3D printed brackets. And that's to hold the keyboard. And you don't really need it because the case, when you put it on, it does hold this all in place. But I think it just keeps the keyboard from sort of flopping around. It's good to just hold up the underside of the bracket when you screw this in because you don't want to push down too hard on it. That is at the furthest point from the edge here, so it's going to put the most force on it. These STL files to 3D print your own brackets are very easily available online. If you just look for C64C keyboard brackets, I think, or something like that, you'll, you'll find the files to print those. And the ones I printed before for the FieldFound64 were the same as this. And then we just connect the LED right here, like so. I was purposefully avoiding using this computer. I was afraid of pushing down on the keyboard while I didn't have brackets in there. So I'm actually glad to have gotten these. Cool, okay, let's just give this thing a quick test. I'm not sure the last time I've used this machine. It may not work. You never know with 64s, they sometimes break just sitting there on your shelf. Although I personally feel that the short boards are the most reliable and boom, it just came right up. And look at that great video quality. Although I think I need to do my RF modulator mod and cut that capacitor out to sharpen the picture up. Earlier, we were denied the 8-bit dance party, so let's, let's see if Donkey Kong Arcade works on this thing. Not to mention, we'll hear the strange difference in sound quality with this 8580 SID chip over the other one. Donkey Kong Arcade.
Phew, that was a good dance party. All right, let me swap this out with my Ziff 64. Ah, oh, the Ziff 64. This thing has taken so much abuse and it just keeps working forever. I just love it. I broke out the Ziff 64 because Mike sent me this Lumafix and I wanna try it out versus the one I have. See if this one works any better. Incidentally, the one in my right hand is one that I built myself and I never could get this working very well. I did try swapping out some of the capacitor values, which is why they're sitting up on the board. It does use a dip package instead of a surface mount for this 74 IC here. I forgot which one it is. Oh, annoying. I'm gonna have to pull off my MSI heat sink off my Vic because it's covering the potentiometers. Lame, lame. That's lame. Let's just pop that off. Whoop, there it goes. I found that on Ziff sockets, when you stick in these pin header things, you know, that aren't dips, you have to kind of hold it up slightly, close the socket, and then you just push it in all the way like that. Oh, look, I forgot that I'm running the PLA Advance in this thing right now. Cool. I need to switch over to S-Video from Composite because that's going to give me a better indication of what the lines look like. All right, here we go. Turn it on. Hopefully we get a picture. And we do, and it looks horrible. Now, this is because the Lumafix is way out of adjustment right now. So let me twiddle these little potentiometers and at least clean this up to some extent. All right, they're all clicking. And I gotta say, that picture looks pretty great with the Lumafix completely disabled. Let me turn this off and on. This particular 64, sometimes on certain power cycles, you have vertical bars that are worse than other times. And I don't really know why it's kind of random as to how bad it's gonna be. So usually after a few power cycles, I should be able to get it looking kind of cruddy. Sort of surprised. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now we have jail bars. Got it. So just because I should RTFM, there is a manual. Enjoy image with less stripes. Hmm, manufactured by Shareware Plus. So we have three adjustments. The top one is AEC, PHIO, and the chroma. So the bottom one won't really have effect on the jail bars, but these two will. And the bottom, number nine, turn on your 64, and don't worry if it looks worse. Adjust the AEC, PHIO, and CHR until you have an image that you're pleased with. AEC is usually the biggest problem. That's what eases the main vertical lines. Adjusting PHIO may help also. Chroma needs adjustment only to lower color signals if you're experiencing checker pattern or green and red thin colored lines. Well, we're not having those problems. What we see are just the traditional vertical bars. This particular 64 is just never that bad. Let me start with adjusting the top one to see if we can eliminate those or reduce them. So turning it is a definitely changing it, but is it making it better? I can't say I really think so. So here in this point, in the blue section, it's definitely better. But now it's worse up in the light blue section. Let me try turning the second one. This is behaving exactly like the one I have. It's just about kind of minimizing them. But the issue is, is it's all about, it does sort of change them, but it doesn't make it better to me. I'm gonna reboot the system with the Easy Flash because this has a bit more colors on there. So we'll get a better look at the screen. All right, so with this power cycle, the dark blue seems to have no gel bars. The light blue sort of, but the gray has it as does purple. So I'm gonna adjust to try to minimize those. All right, so I'm adjusting the top screw and it's definitely minimized it here in the gray. Let me try turning the second from the top. I'd say it's a little more pleasing inside the gray area, also in the purple here. But now in the blue, it's not pleasing and there's, there's bars there now and there weren't originally. So yep, thumbs down and cannot recommend this type of Lumafix. I was disappointed when I built my own. This was built by someone else and it's a slightly different design with surface mount and it's exactly the same. The weird behaviors are still there and I just don't think it's worth your time. Now I've removed that Lumafix. I could put my MSI heatsink back on my Vic2 chip there to keep it nice and cool. Also, by the way, just in case anyone's wondering, I have tried these in other 64s. So in case you're thinking that it's my, my Ziff socket here that's causing these issues, I see exactly the same behavior of these in other 64s. I've tried it in several different versions, different versions of motherboard, and I just, I'm not happy with these in any of them. Mike also sent me this thing here, the Strikelink Wi-Fi built by Alwiz. It's got an ESP8266 on here. That's this little board right here. And it's on this larger board, which is sold as the Node MCU, if you look on eBay for them. And then just a very simple PCB, 
which obviously wires up power and a couple serial lines, probably RX and TX, to the 64. So this is all about what software is on the CSC64 to get this thing working. Plugged into the 64, I fully anticipate when I turn it on, I'll get some red lights. Oh, there we go, we got a blue light. I'm gonna do a quick Google to find out what software works with this exactly. A quick Google reveals this uses CCGMS 2017 V4, also by Always. I got it here on CSDB. I loaded the PRG file onto my SDIEC, which is connected to the back of this computer. So boot this thing up. We'll go into Jaffe DOS. Oh, the keyboard is not working. Oh, um, what? Why did it start working? Space for back. Wait, what? Okay, I uh, must have had a bad connection there. I saved it into apps and it's right here, ccgms, whatever, whatever, dot PRG. Yeah, ccgms is a terminal emulator. This is for using like Telnet BBS. So let's see if I can get this thing working here. Here we go, UP9600. I think that's the one it told me to use. Yeah, so he says here UP9600 and then I got to switch to 9600 baud and then I have to save, then I go to ASCII mode. Then I will need to configure SSID and password and then I should be able to connect and then write the configs in here. Yeah, so this is a normal like modem type Wi-Fi modem firmware that's loaded on the Node MCU. I actually made a couple of these. These inside these 3D printed boxes here are RS-232 adapters and there's a Node MCU installed in the back of these running Wi-Fi modem firmware. So I can connect either of these to a regular PC or any device with a regular serial port and these absolutely work. I am not sure I've ever shown this on the channel but I have this modem here. So it's a 1200 baud Commodore modem but I've actually modified it and I have gutted the phone part of it and I've installed an RS-232 port in there. So this plus this gets me on the internet, which I think is the equivalent of what this little thing is doing on the back here. So back to here, if I change the baud rate to 9600 and I hit save phone, bo phone book and config, we'll save that. And let's see if we can do AT now, not quite. So the firmware that's loaded on the Node MCU should act like a modem. So a normal AT command like this should just say OK, and you should be able to like do ATDT to dial. This one's obviously not connected to my Wi-Fi right now, but those little red 3D printed ones, of course, are already pre-configured those. But those respond to the AT command. In fact, I used one of those the other day. I'm qu not quite sure what this thing is doing, but it's definitely acting up. Let's pull this off. Anyway, I'm not going to fool around with this any further because I think this thing needs a firmware flash and I just that's beyond the scope of this mail call video. But yes, if you want to get your 64 connected online to get on BBSs, you can make one of these pretty cheaply. I think probably that PCB doesn't cost much to make. And then you just need a user port connector and you need a Node MCU. Those are a few dollars from China. Put those all together, flash the correct firmware on there and you are off to the races and you will be able to get on Telnet BBSs just like the old days, just no phone line required. And that leaves us with the last thing, which is the micro cassettes. Let's see if I can get this to not glare. Cool, plugs into the cassette port, 3.5 millimeter input, and a CD that's likely full of tape files that I can play back on a computer and load into the 64 through this little device. Oh, and he even gave me that TRS cable. I'll use that to hook this up. So we'll just plug this little thing into the cassette port. Oh, that's a nice fit, just like that, excellent. Here's the TRS cable that he sent along with this package of stuff. Since my OnePlus 6 has a head headphone jack, oh, it's all a little crusty. I keep a case on here. Don't normally uh, take it out of the case. So there's a bit of gunk built up around the headphone jack. It should still work though. Just connect that up like so. We'll load up Tap Dancer. This is a program that is designed for doing exactly this. Look at even this has a Commodore data set. I don't even know if you can find this program on Google Play anymore. If you can, it's called Tap Dancer, like T-A-P-D-A-N-C-E-R. But if not, you'll just have to sideload this. If you're on iOS, I have no idea programs like this even exist. So you're on your own, sorry. So I've copied clax.tap to tap file, which is a tape file onto my phone. Uh, this is just sitting here trying to load still. So I'm gonna power cycle the 64. A little shift run stop, load on tape. I'm gonna turn the volume up. I looked quickly at the instructions for this thing. And it said, um, you should put the volume at like 75%. And it's obviously gonna vary from one device to another. Press play on tape, press play. And there we go, this pops up and I should have to hit the Commodore button when it says found clacks, it should pop up. Commodore button will tell it to keep loading that file. Will this work though? There it is, it did work. While this loads, you may remember my modified data set that has an RCA jack as an audio input. 
Now the read write heads basically goes through a little logic, various stages with op amps, amplifies the signal, turns into a digital. I have this connected sort of halfway through. People have wanted me to show that modification to see how you could do it for your own. But the one problem is there are many versions of the data set internally that look different. So it's not easy for me to show you this one because you're gonna open up yours, it's gonna be totally different. I did this modification by using my oscilloscope to probe where to do it. And honestly, if you wanna do this type of thing where you wanna load stuff from your computer or your phone, I really think you should invest in something like the micro cassette instead because it's a lot simpler. You're not fooling around with one of these old data sets unless you wanna have the nostalgia of this on your desk. These are just easier or specifically buy the version that has an SD card slot. You copy the tap files directly onto it and you don't even need to worry about audio devices. I think that one's called Tap Duino, I think. I don't have one, so I can't tell you for sure. But this thing clearly is gonna work well once it finishes loading. And there we go, Klax. It is the 90s and there is time for Klax. <laughs> I don't think I've ever played this game, so apologies for not knowing what to do here. Oh, it's like touch. Okay, well, I'm not sure which keys to even push. Uh, I'm supposed to move this, I am sure. Okay, I, I'm terrible, I'm just turning this off. I'd have to read the instructions to see how to work that game. But as you notice, I loaded that without issue with Tap Dancer off my OnePlus here. So any old Android phone, you can buy like a $20 prepaid one, load this program on there, and those always have headphone jacks, especially the cheap ones. And then you can load all the games without having to hook up a computer and a laptop and stuff. So that's just something to keep in mind. I will look around and try to find a link uh, for where you can buy this, and I'll put it in the description below. I think this thing's pretty useful. It's quite cool. So thank you very much, Mike, for sending in this neat assortment of stuff. There's more than this. This is just all I could fit in my hands. I really like this micro cassette, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to get this thing working. I'll reflash some new firmware onto this off camera. All right. We have a package here from Raymond in Lapeer, Michigan. Hi to all my viewers in Michigan. That's of course the state here in the United States where Detroit is, a motor city where Ford and General Motors have their headquarters. I received this package on the 21st of August. So hey, could be doing worse. What do we have in here? I have a feeling it's RAM. And we do have RAM. Yeah, I think I was talking about on my last video how I have so much RAM that I couldn't possibly use any more of it. Although my caveat on the last video, I think if I recall, was that 30 pin memory was okay. And there's a pretty big bag of 30 pin memory here. And then it looks like he has sent me also some 72 pin memory. So I have a lot of 72 pin memory, but I am always looking for things like 32 megabyte 72 pin SIMs. Those are just a little less common, a little more rare, and you can really max out a computer with memory when you have the 32 meg version. Let's take a look at this on the bench. So a ton of RAM. This is all from Raymond. As you see here, there's a big pile of 30 pin memory on the right and a pile, a smaller pile of 72 pin memory on the left. For the 72 pin RAM identification, I use my handy dandy truth table here, which comes from the 72 pin RAM what is it, JDEC or JE, JE deck? I don't know how to say it. This is the standard that developed this type of RAM and there are little jumpers on all of them. So I'm just gonna quickly go through and sort these. So the 72 pin RAM, these are four meg sticks. There's one eight meg stick. There are two 16 meg sticks. That's useful, I, I like these large capacity ones. And then this pile, this top one here is definitely two megabytes. It even says it right here, 512K times 36, so it's parity. These ones, I'm not sure, they don't have jumpers and they're not marked, so who knows what they are. And for the 30 pin RAM, all of these are one megabyte modules. These are the 256, kind of boring. And then this module is a strange one. It's, as far as I can tell, it's four megabytes with parity. And each one of these is two megabytes by eight bits. I looked at the data sheet. These are Siemens chips and they're made in France. The date on this is 1996, so that's an oddball module. But I have a lifetime supply of one meg modules now, enough to upgrade all of those classic Macs that have come through the basement, I think, maybe. There's been a lot of those, haven't there? Any Anyhow, thank you very much, Raymond, for sending in the RAM. I am definitely full up. I know I've said this so many times, but really, if you wanna send me RAM, please send me an email first. 
uh, and talk to me about it because at this point I'm, I'm literally running out of space. I have a little bin for putting my RAM. It is overflowing. I had to separate the RAM now and take some of the, the DDR2 and 3 stuff and put it in a separate box. Anyways, yeah, so thanks again, Raymond. There's a package. It's from Floyd in Woodbridge, Virginia, here in the United States. Hi to all my Virginia viewers. I received this package on the 14th of September, which was only a couple days ago, which shows that I'm actually catching up on my mail call. When I'll actually have this in a video on my channel, not so sure. Wow, okay, this is cool looking. Classic bot classic. So it's a little robot that looks like a Macintosh classic. You see the back of the packaging there. There was no letter with it, so I'm not sure who sent this. So let's take a look at this on the bench. Here is the classic bot from Floyd, which looks like a little Mac classic, has a little plug icon there. I don't really know what this thing's all about. There it is, the classic bot classic. On the side, it does say, find out more about us at classicbot.com, play some toys. I'm looking for a sad onion, but unfortunately there isn't one. It just says, choking hazard, uh, not for children under 14. 14, that's, 13 year olds can't play with this, really. That's kind of interesting. And uh, yeah, don't throw it in the trash. <laughs> Made in China. Let me slice open the classic pot. He's screaming right now. A plus to these guys for not putting this in that impossible to open blister packaging. In very Apple form, the getting started with your classic. I am pretty sure when you bought a Macintosh, you ended up with a getting started piece of paper, probably at the Apple IIs as well. Uh, I was sitting here like trying to turn the page to find that it's backwards. That's a bit unusual. I really appreciate the font selection and this is the one that Apple would have used, I am pretty sure. This comes with the figure, which is the Macintosh Classic itself. The font suitcase, which yes, fonts on the older systems, like System 7 and earlier, had this icon. And then the mouse bot model G5431B, which is a bit weird. Detachable arms are held on by magnet, the perfect way to turn your figure into its pure form. Oh, neat. Okay, so you could take the legs and arms off and turn it into computer mode. Okay, this thing is absolutely adorable. And then the default arm position. Well, I really have to say, even the way this is looking right here, sitting on the desk, it's so cute. This is just how it, it sort of fell out when I put it on the table. Okay, so yes, the arms do just come right off and the legs as well, I take it, maybe? Ah, the legs are not held on with magnets. It's a little peg that goes into a hole, but and he's not super well balanced. So if he's gonna stand up on his own, you have to basically, oh. <laughs> that might've broken the CRT if this were a real computer. To get him to stand on his own, he has to stand like this. I take it that these arms probably stick. Yep, sort of, well, actually, there's a good range that they can be. The little mouse is adorable too. Look, it even has a, mall, a little ball and the little Teflon strip, the bump there. It's weird how the wire sticks out forwards, but I guess that's just how it is. I wonder if there's a way for him to kind of hold on to the mouse. Now, the arms don't hold on with enough force on the side of the machine. I mean, because the arms are held on with magnets, they there's definitely not any kind of gripping force. Like if I try to hang this font purse, let's just try it. The font bag looks like it should clip in here. Yep, it does. And then he can hold the font. Oh dear. <laughs> Oh dear, this thing is adorable. It really is super cute. It's a great replica of the Mac too. There are the two reset interrupt buttons right there. There's a little protrusion. On the front, it even has the little pinhole for ejecting your floppy disk. If I pull the legs off, there we go. Now it's just the pure computer and computer mode. What's odd though is, listen. There's something inside here kind of floating around. The back of the machine is a very detailed approximation. In fact, you may not be able to tell, but inside the IEC plug there, there are pins even, and they painted the switch. So thank you very much, Floyd, for sending in the Classic Bot Classic. This thing is adorable. 
Okay, so we have a package here. This one comes from Robert in Banstead, United Kingdom. So hi to all my UK viewers. The writing on this FedEx label is so small that I did have to take a picture <laughs> of the name and address so I could read it with my old eyes. Getting old and old eyesight is no joke. I wear glasses, as you can obviously tell, but I really, really need to get some bifocals, something that has magnification built in so that I can look to the bottom of my glasses or whatnot and actually read what I'm looking at. We have a note. Dear Adrian, first off, I'm a huge fan of your channel. So informative and entertaining. Having said that, I found your recent series on the Mac restoration rather disturbing. I've recently had a Mac SE donated to me by a work colleague. I have yet to crack it open and I'm really anxious about the electrolyte and battery related nastiness I'm going to find inside. Well, Robert, I know you sent this several weeks ago, so you probably cracked it open by now, but luckily a Mac SE doesn't have a problem with leaky caps. You only have to worry about a leaking battery on that and that's it. And the chance of a leaking battery, if you saw my series, I mean, I had a whole bunch of those machines and it was just one computer that had a leaking battery. So it's a much lower chance. If you have a Mac SE 30 or a Classic or a Classic 2 leaking capacitors, it's like a 99% chance that that will have happened. But the battery thing, not so much. He goes on to say, he sent a little goodie bag for my channel, nothing exciting, but a couple of things you might find useful. Now Robert's talking about what's in the package, so let's just put that aside for now, and I wanna open this stuff up, take a look at it, and then we'll go back to the letter because he talks about what they are. Okay, so the first thing here are little Chemtronics wipes or something. So let's look at that in a sec. And then a couple pens and some candy. You know me, I love my candy. All right, so the first thing are these Chemtronics wipes. Now, if I open up one of these, let's just take a look at these just real quick. So it's like a kind of a cotton swab in a way, but it looks like it has a foam pad of types on the end. And on the packaging here, it says chamois tips. And it actually shows someone cleaning and wiping the, the rotating head on a VCR. He says in his letter that he sent chamois swabs. They are specifically designed for cleaning magnetic and optical pickups in disk drives and tape machines. Unlike cotton buds, they won't leave tiny deposits of cotton on the head. They are considerably more expensive though, 36 US dollars for a pack of 50, but I've found they can be rinsed off with IPA and reused a few times. Well, that's amazing. So what, this is like a $36 package of these things. So the next thing are some pens. Let's just cut the bag open. So these say Edding 751, and these are obviously paint pens because they have a ball inside, so you shake them up. And he says in his letter, he's sending two white paint pens. I use them all the time to mark chips that are either good or bad. Being white, of course, it shows up much more clearly than a Sharpie. Very true. I mean, the Sharpie's not hard to read, but it comes off really easily, especially with any alcohol around there, and it is not easy to read. You have to give these a good shake before use though, and you'll need to apply a little pressure when you first press down on the nib to get the paint flowing. They can be a little tricky the first time. If you press too hard, you end up with a big blob of paint. Well, that's awesome. I've actually been looking for these. It says paint marker right on here. I've been looking for something like this for quite a while. Obviously, I haven't looked very hard because I don't think those are probably that hard to find, but I do really appreciate it. I'm definitely gonna try these out. And then lastly, he sent some candy. So it's Smarties. In his letter, he says, finally, the most important are the Smarties. You may think they look like M&Ms and you may even think they taste like M&Ms, but they're not. They're Smarties and they're very British. Smarties were first manufactured in 1882 and the Smarties name introduced in 1937. M&Ms weren't introduced until 1941. Sadly, Smarties are no longer sold in classical packaging, no doubt to make the packaging 100% recyclable. The original Smarties tube was a bit of a design icon, and he has a photograph here, which I'll inset, but it looks like a tube. Now, I think to some Brits, this might be hard to believe, but Canada has a lot of candy that is sold in Britain that is not sold in the US, and Smarties is one of them. I grew up eating these. In fact, when I was a kid, I had never really had an M&M until I came to the US, but in French-speaking Canada, in Montreal, I ate Smarties all the time. And the packaging was not like this, and it wasn't in the tube like it was in the UK. It was in a little box, and that's the way they came. And, and the thing about Smarties versus M&Ms, and for anyone who hasn't had these, it's very much like the regular chocolate M&M. It's just chocolate with a kind of a hard candy on the outside that's coated in a color, right? And they're not really flavored, they're just chocolate, and then they just have colors on them. 
But the thing I really found about Smarties that was different than M&M's when I moved to the U.S. is that M&M's melt in your hand a lot more slowly than Smarties. From what I remember, it takes just seconds for the color on the Smarties to start washing off and sticking to your hand, leaving like a sugary color coating behind. And M&M's, while they do that as well, they certainly seem a little more resistant. And here's a couple Smarties in my hand. You're not gonna be able to see them very well, but they have more colorful colors than M&M's, which only come in whatever five colors. So this has like a, a off orange, there's a brown, there's sort of a pinkish color. You would just put them in your hand like this for a little while and you start getting Smarties melting on your hands. Now these ones aren't melting yet, so I don't know if they've changed up the formula. Let me try one here. Oh yeah, this is just like I remember them being when I was a kid. Yeah, so not having had a Smartie in a long time, and I've definitely had M&Ms <laughs> more often, the candy coating on these is a lot crunchier, it's a lot thicker, and then it also is a lot sweeter. So it's not so much just a pure chocolate flavor, you're really getting kind of a candy sugar coating in the hard shell that's on these. Now, I don't remember if this was the case when I was a kid in Canada, but these are made by Nestle, at least they are now, These or these UK variants are. But Robert is right, these taste quite a bit different than the chocolate M&Ms, and they're good. I mean, they're a good candy. They're chocolate and sugary candy mixed together. How can you go wrong with that? I'm actually starting to wonder if there's a slight flavor in the candy shell that is different based on the color. I really don't remember that from when I was a kid, but I'm getting just ever so slight differences between the different colors. So that might be my imagination, but if it is true, put a comment in the comment section below. All right, let's take a look at this stuff on the bench. Candy, paint markers, and cleaning things. Uh, awesome combo that Robert sent over. So these are the chamois pads, which as he mentioned are quite expensive, made by Chemtronics. And here's what they look like up close. So it's, is this? Oh, interesting how the writing has worn off there. Chemtronics. Plastic, I suppose. The stick is plastic. And then the chamois is actually adhered with glue onto the end. What a neat little thing. And he mentioned that they are definitely reusable. You can clean them and they're, they're great. And I like how thin it is. So it's good for getting into little narrow spaces. And then, of course, since it's a chamois and not a cotton swab, this cotton comes off so easily if you hook it onto a IC leg or whatever, just a little part under the circle board, it rips just like that. It's so easy. These are such crap, really, for cleaning. This, on the other hand, these are going to be awesome. Here's some specifications on the back. I wonder what's the deal with this blacked out section. But here's the information about the company that makes them here. ITW Contamination Control, the Netherlands. And I just, look at that. I love it. They're showing cleaning uh, tape head, VCR tape head there. That's the spinning drum that reads the tape. That is a neat use for this because you don't want to leave little bits of hair or fiber behind on that. You want it to be completely clean. Oh, wait, Chemtronics right here, Kennesaw, Georgia. So I'm wondering if this is like a parent company or maybe this is a seller in Europe or something. But yeah, Chemtronics.com. These are from copyright 2014. I think my primary use case for these will be cleaning disk drive heads because you have to kind of get in between the top and the bottom head. There's not a lot of room. So the thin profile of these will come in super handy. And here is the cool paint pen, the Edding 751 paint marker. Says here, water resistant on most surfaces, light fast, opaque, heat resistant, and shake well, remove cap and pump. I know the camera is probably not focusing properly, but it does say made in Japan. Of course it's made in Japan. They make all the best pens and things there. Always, okay, yep, so there it is. Shake and then push down and pump. So that's how you get the paint flowing. All right, let's try to open this thing. I'm gonna cut through the plastic here. I don't see a little pull tab. There we go. All right. So there's the nib. Here is a little box for testing on. So I need to shake well. I probably should have done that with the cap on. There we go. Okay, here we go. And then you pump a little bit to get it going. <laughs> okay, anytime now. I see it starting to flow. There we go. Okay, now we're ready to test with something better than a white box. How about this, the inside of a Macintosh Classic case? So I'm just gonna write ADB right here, A-T-B. Oh, these are awesome, I love it. ADB 2020. 
Yeah, I totally love this. All right, Robert has said this would be a good use case for writing on my bad chips or on the good chips, you know, with check marks, tick marks, X's, things like that. So let me grab some bad chips. So I think everyone knows what that means. It's time to break out the dead chips bin. Every time I show this thing, there are comments from people like, why do you keep these bad chips? That's just so stupid, blah, blah, blah. I just, it's pretty hilarious. I love my dead parts bin and this is why. So here we go. Here's a bad memory module, right? I had already put an X here and put a line through it, but let's just put on some X's on here. And yeah, this is amazing. This is great. This is gonna be super helpful. Like if this thing were good, I could put a tick mark or say it was eight megabytes in size, I could put an eight. I mean, it certainly shows up a lot better than a Sharpie does on a black chip. So thank you very much, Robert, for sending in the chamois swabs, two of these amazing paint pens, and of course, two boxes of Smarties. Well, one's already partially consumed. Okay, we have a package here. This comes from Joe in Fort Collins, Colorado. Hi to all my Colorado viewers. Of course, Colorado is a state in the US where Denver is. That's the most famous and well-known city there. This package is the very last package that I received in August. So this came on the 31st of August. And after this, I'll be opening stuff in September. And it's actually September. So I won't be quite so far behind. Now as to when you might see this on an actual mail call, it may be a little ways off in the future. I've opened up quite a few packages before this one. Okay, what do we have in here? Well, I see right off the bat, what looks like an Apple power cord peeking out here. One for an Apple laptop, that is. And yes, indeed, I see the round spaceship Apple power supply from uh, like a PowerBook G3 era. Here's the power cord. And yep, it does look exactly like what I thought. There is a keyboard here that is missing a key. That's obviously the way it was. This looks just like the power book that I worked on on my channel a while ago. That was my father's power book. The computers of this era have names like Pismo and things like that. I have no idea which one it was. A lot of fans were like, I can't believe you don't know which one it is. Oh, there's a note on the inside of the computer here. The note reads, Dear Adrian, seeing your video on the PowerBook G3 back in April reminded me that I had a G3 sitting around that a friend gave me some time ago. This one isn't in perfect condition, but I hope that you'll have some use for it in the basement, even if it is just for parts. It does work, but you have to replug the CMOS battery in whenever it has been disconnected from power. You'll also notice the hard drive is missing and the CD-ROM is a bit of a hack job, though it does work too. Thanks for your great videos and enjoy. Best regards, Joe. Cool, let's just take a quick look at this on the bench. A PowerBook G3, here it is. Now the power supply, I mentioned this in the last video about this computer, the one I worked on for my father. This is just ridiculous. I think that the idea is pretty cool. I like the idea of it being compact like this and the cable going in here. I mean, it does look like a yo-yo. Really, you could do yo-yo things with this. <laughs> But um, where I think it falls down is this power cord. Like, it's great it has cable management for the laptop part, but when I connect this power cord, it just sticks out and then you have this whole thing. That's, this doesn't seem very elegant. This is no better than like one of those bricks. Anyway, Joe sends an extra keyboard. This is a parts keyboard, obviously. It's uh, missing two keys, but it's got that translucent key thing going on. Anyhow, let's see if this laptop is working. The computer itself, internally, it's in pretty good shape. The keyboard is nice. There's no issues in here. Just like my father's PowerBook G3, and I think Clint from LGR just got one of these. This middle part here is sort of a rubbery texture. It's not horrible and sticky, but it doesn't look so great. As you see, it's a bit scratched up. Luckily, it's not that horrible late 90s soft touch that got sticky and is so gross on so much electronics. Apple did a better quality coating than that. I am noticing there is a crack in the case right here. So I guess this thing, I do kind of recall that there should have been a cover that goes over all these ports and either someone removed it or it has snapped off at some point. It's funny to imagine, but Apple was actually putting infrared on their laptops and you can see the receiver is right in there, the transmitter receiver. Of course it's gone. It, it, whatever, probably this laptop got dropped when the case got cracked and it lost that cover. The battery is missing as well. Well, it's kind of unfortunate because I think uh, with that other one I had, didn't I take the battery apart and just save the cover so there wasn't a gaping hole there, but the battery was just gone. 
Judging by the cracks and the bashed in corners and bits of broken things on this laptop, it has had a very hard life. So the fact that it does work while well, Joe says it works is pretty amazing. For testing, we just need to get the yo-yo out. Whoa. <laughs> Let's see, does this thing power on? It does not. He did mention in his letter, I might have to unplug the battery to get this thing to turn on. So let me remember how I did that and do that now. Taking off the keyboard was really easy. There are two little tabs you push down here and it just pops right off and disconnects from the motherboard there. This was the hard drive caddy. There is no hard drive installed. And I thought the connection for the CMOS battery was this blue wire right here, which I just unplugged. And that didn't seem to make any difference. This thing doesn't show any signs of life whatsoever. So I think it's gonna require further disassembly, which I unfortunately just don't have time to do right now. So thank you very much, Joe, for sending me this PowerBook G3. I'll have to work on this in the future, try to get this thing up and running. And that's gonna be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that thumbs down button, put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. And of course, hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel with that little bell icon to be maybe notified if Google feels like doing its magic thing, which it does not half the time. So, you know, whatever. Anyways, that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.